Hi, welcome to One Word a Day. I'm Sophie, your pilot into the universe of Chinese. We're going to do, continue our flight into the deep of this language, and I'm honored to be your guide and to be your pilot. Um, okay, so yesterday we talked about uh, what type of scale of this matter can be considered as a which is, I use the example of the national scale. If it's a national policy carried out in every part of the country, it's going to be regarded as 姿势, and ti da uh, means volume, when scale, right? And uh, this talks about the uh, the impact, the impact of this matter, how you how you carry out a certain policy are going to make huge impact to the whole body of that nation's wealth or behavior or mentality uh, in whatever metric you're measuring. Okay, so today we continue with ti. Ti xu means qing. So yesterday ti came from human body. Um, and I want to point out that this is traditional Chinese and this is contemporary Chinese. And both of them mean human body. That's the, the root meaning. And I want to point out at a simplification process, which is what well, I talked about before, like 1950s, uh, when after CCP came into power, they want to increase the literacy of the, the nation, you know, equal life, equality or equity, okay? What Western right now is the key word back then was already a policy and carried out. So this equalizing process happening in all regards that came from the same <clears throat> ideology, right? Um, that curve was flattened. Everybody are, were given the chance to education, wealth, resource, whatever. That's the ideal. And so down the same le le ideology, right, line of thinking, or um, this equalizing of education um, make language more accessible to the commoners became a thing. And therefore, the simplification process of Chinese characters. Look how different the two were uh, as, as characters. Like this, if you talk to a uh, um, first grader, or I guess for Chinese students, maybe second grade would come across this word. So if you, talk, if you teach it to second grader, this is much more doable than this one. This I don't know, as a non-Chinese speaker, but as a non-traditional Chinese user, this one, if you ask me to write it down, yeah, probably I can at this moment, but in a few days, I probably forget like what, what's going on in there. Too many strokes, right? So the simplification process is necessary uh, from that mentality. And uh, it's a beneficial, I'm part of the, the benefit, a benefactor of the, um, who received mass education, massly and cheaply available education when it came to the U.S. U.S. college education is so expensive. In China, it's almost close to free. So that's the, you know, some of the pros and cons in there. I just want to, because I, I kind of sound negative now toward the garment of the garmency over there regarding zero COVID and all that. Um, but they did have some, equalizing uh, moves back then. Okay, T, uh, in contemporary, in the simplified Chinese, simply use this human figure on the left side and use the root because this is a tree symbol and we put an indicator out there to mean that's the root, the bottom portion of the this living thing, this tree. So it kind of makes sense as well, right? It's explainable. It's about the root of a person which is your physical existence, and that's your body. That's the line of uh, uh, logic over there, of the creator. I can kind of imagine in the 1950s, the language creator that's in a simplification process, how they are thinking. They put the symbols two together to create the, to mean, um, create the meaning of body, human body. That makes sense. Okay, but in this case, it actually means sense. Okay, 
So our human body is a huge sensor, if you know it. <laughs> our skin is the biggest organ on our body, and skin on it are full of sensors. So this body converted to another meaning means to sense something. Not only the skin level, your your all your sensors, your eyes, your your ears, your your nose. And even some sixth sense, right? Like I can sense microwave, unexplainable. Um, but that kind of sensor as a human body is very uh, logical because, um, yeah, we're 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 a big sensor out here. So that means sense here because it got to sense something. The subject is here. People conditions, okay. And shu shu means. 体恤民情, okay, did I read that out? Okay, 恤 means concern because it got this human heart symbol. You can see it in side by side in two characters. That's beautiful. We can see how Chinese characters are put together. But on the right side here is blood symbol because this is container, as you can see, almost you can see it visually like a tall glass, a uh, glass of wine, right? Uh, this something <laughs> you can imagine as wine because the color wise it would be similar is red right because it's huge uh, it's blood contained in that uh, container that high glass and okay this according to scholars is about human sacrifice wait not exactly human sacrifice but is a kind of ancient ceremony to talk to God to the divine. And the divine somehow in the ancient society's mindset would like to see some blood. And that's kind of coded as this is serious business. This is bloody serious, probably. And so we show some blood in that container as, I guess, a greeting line. So instead of hello, it's like, hi, blood here. Listen to us. We have a big trouble, something like that, right? I would imagine that's the logic. I'm not sure what's the two standing thing next to it mean, no clue. Um, the whole thing eventually got abstracted into this. That means blood. So originally it could be sacrifice and sacrifice a lot of times is sheep because sheep is the most delicious and prized uh, protein meat source and probably ancient society regard sheep as the best kind of sacrifice. But I mean, I don't exactly know if Chinese society, ancient times, they have human sacrifice as um, the ancient Aztec, other civilizations. Um, so this blood, assuming it's animal, animal blood. So this animal blood sacrifice in a container image eventually generalized in all kinds of blood. And because where we as language users, most of times referring to ourselves, right? We're talking about our sorrows and pains, our blood. So eventually this blood, when we see this blood, the first response is well, most likely it's human blood, but it's a generic blood, okay? That fluid to keep you going. So blood paired with heart symbol, <laughs> is, I mean, translated, converted to concern. Um, concerned in the sense of it's a worrying, it's, it's concerning. Something is happening that make your blood flow faster a little bit, maybe that's the implication. Some, yeah, blood pumping, flowing kind of concern. So that's the physical response to some mental stress, right? So when we are stressed, our Physically, probably our blood would flow in a certain way, assuming it's faster. So that language creators back then observed this phenomenon and use that as an illustration of how stressed you are. Something in your blood flow changed. So that's how concerned you are. Okay, sensed and concerned people condition. Okay, people came from this... Um, <laughs> this top angled cliff looking thing. So, I mean, I will view the whole picture as a lineage illustration. So imagine lineage of your family in 
in the past, a patriotic society. The son is the family name carrier and probably family wealth inheritor as well, right? Um, so that's the uh, the main route going down. Probably that's a straight line over here. And then your daughter is going to carry somebody else's family name after she got married. And that's some, some kind of a gift away, gave it away. And um, that's something going diagonally. So eventually your family name, like your sons will carry your family name and that you can track down and that you can place it on your family tree. But your daughters are going on somebody else's tree <laughs> is spread out. So eventually things get blurry, I guess, if, if ancient times track their lineage of their family. Imagine they have centuries worth of generations who's who in their family, right? And that will that tree eventually will grow pretty gigantic. Um, and whoever keeping track of that probably scratch their head and like <laughs> this whole whole tree thing is quite a daunting task, uh, given the later generations would face, you know, whose sons and daughters and name change, all that. Um, so that is how I view this as to what this curve line is, what this horizontal line is. I, I'm not sure, maybe in some other later time when I understand this ancient language better myself, I can explain it better. Right now, I'm just viewing it as the straight lineage, the family name carrier, and the diagonal, the, the non-name carrier, sons and daughters. So that's how collectively male, female, um, name carrier, non-name carrier, they all pull together that forms your nation, your people, people living on this land under your governance. And that's regarded like governed people in general terms. Like now everybody's lineage, the branches, the trees, like your, your butt line jump to another tree and then all that, right? Uh, societies, um, marriage of different names and all that. So that's regarded as collectively people, both genders, okay. And then Qing, we have a heart symbol, right? Just like in English, ancient, ancient times, people regard heart as a function, um, function carrier, or carries the function of emotional processing. So the heart symbol is used here as processing some emotions. So as here is concern, over here is more general terms of emotions. It may not be concern. And maybe you feel some feelings toward another gender, that kind of feeling, or you have feelings toward your, um, because this qing is really generic. You compare it with ai qing, which is sort of romantic love, and a qing qing, which is your love toward your uh, family, and then you qing is your love toward your friend, friendship. So we, we can pair it with all kind of uh, your social relationships. Um, and actually gong qing is like shared emotions. That means sympathy I mean, Chinese characters, just amazing. And then the right side came from this qing. Um, it's the sound maker, but the meaning of it is between the blue and the gray. So between the color of water and plant and the mountain, I mean, collectively big water. So between lake and a mountain, maybe. Chinese paintings actually use the same um, color powder a pigment we use the same pigment to depict both the mountain color and the water color imagine that okay it's actually pretty common back then because uh, color theory and or the chemistry i mean petroleum based color production was only a contemporary thing only recent invention before then, people have to use color that they can discover, organic color they can discover from, from nature. So color sources are limited and color expressions are limited and color expressions are limited. I mean, did I say that? I mean, color understanding, that's what I mean, okay. Um, understanding limited. So Chinese culture back then, the mountain color and the water color, people don't distinguish. They re regarded 
in the same category with this qing, this bluish greenish color. It's kind of, you know, versatile color. And this versatility paired with the heart symbol, this emotional processing, I think is a very uh, appropriate um, that because you can really process a ton of different feelings, right? Um, in contemporary sentiment analysis, say, it's only positive, negative, neutral. I mean, it's pretty blah, but human emotions can go in all kinds of directions. It's not just two-dimensional positive, negative, no. So in this, I mean, in Qing, actually, it's blue and green. It's also two polars, right? And then in between these two extreme colors, blue and green, there is infinite shades of blue green uh, so probably that's legit if you put a positive number negative number um and then something neutral so the whole spectrum of feelings if we want to visualize that way but in any case is feelings but over here we're talking about qing not individual human uh internal feeling level it's actually external conditions it's how things are happening it's not up to you how you feel it probably like uh, people's feel like people's uh, feedback of how uh, how things are happening people's voices basically uh is probably a reflection of the the conditions they are living in could be but the meaning here is yeah the the measurement of how people feel about um, their living conditions, probably. Um, so qi xu min qing. I I think hard of uh, how how to translate it. Basically, it's talking about you. You want to sense. You want to be able to. I mean, this talking from the perspective of the govern um, of the of the ruler or the. Con you know, people on the top. This is a top-down angle, not bottom-up. Because, okay, imagine this language was created and used over time. And in the middle of it, like thousands of years, it was um, central garment structure. So actually is talking about the, the advice to the emperor, like for the emperor, for you to stay on your throne for a long time, for you and your, your son, your grandson to keep staying on that chair, you need to be able to, to sense and to feel concerned, to have a little bit of sympathy of the human living conditions of your people. So that's what it's talking about. Um, and I think how to translate it appropriately. So mean is on a bigger scale. It's not the individual, it's collectively as a society. So I, I translate it as social. And then qi xu, okay, it's sense and then concern, like a sympathy, sense it and have some sympathy toward how how the social conditions are. I use sensing. I only take partial of the meaning. So social sensing, it sounds fancy, right? It's alliteration. And I thought that's my invention, but no, uh, when I search on the internet, social sensing, I, I, I pull up this image. It's a 19, no, it's a 2016. So six years ago, a uh, publication in some engineering project. Uh, so uh, Wuhan University by a group of uh, engineers from Wuhan. And they're talking about social geospatial sensing. So basically a type of sensing of social on a social scale. So multiple people, in a in an area. In this case, they'll showcase uh, the Pudong International Airport. Wait, I forgot the airport sign. It's P something. Um, that's the, it, the one of the busiest of airport in the world, I guess. Many, many bodies on there. And so they overlay the social messaging. Like whoever is sending out uh, you know, on their WeChat or some other social messaging. Uh, of a message you can see like a per, I think a 50 meter to that granularity. Within the 50 meter, how many people are sending out messages back then? Because, hey, people are waiting in the airport. They have a ton of time 
on hand, what they're going to do. They are going to talk to their chat to their friends, right? So this is kind of a snapshot of that data time in that airport, how people bodily, physically, in a spatial sense, are um, like the density of people. You can see people cluster. Probably these are the rooms of waiting rooms and whole lot of people and other people scattered around in different part of interestingly i mean this is guess right people who are going to fly within that uh waiting room that building and these are outside um and even outside people are texting interesting right <laughs> so uh this is the kind of social sensing i mean ancient times i guess the ruler wish only couldn't ever dreamed of such technology at their disposal that they can sense exactly the density, the spatial distribution of their people, where they are. And 2022, uh, another keyword is social listening. So that's an, another way of sensing people. Instead of spatial sense, social listening is more about social uh, sentiment regarding certain topics, as positive or negative, what are the keywords, what are trendy words, so all that. So this social, this mingqing uh, in the social media age can be uh, applied in, um, like it can be sensed in a whole new level powered by technology and, uh, you know, and our willingness to give out our data or probably we didn't. I mean, this uh, people's privacy data, privacy thing is another saying going on, but this is kind of taking social media usage data layered with ge uh, geography data, and then you can sense exactly where people are. Um, so that's a contemporary version of how, like how to teach you meeting, how, um, that, I mean, this meeting is only in spatial sense, uh, but if in social listening, you can, you can really listen to how collectively the society are responding to events, what people are talking about, the positive and negative, things like that. Okay, that's the 21st century version of Qi Ming Qing, Cashing into the Currency of Thinking by One Word a Day with Sophie sitting another day.